a full key, stack a box in my hand Gonna cast a few lines with my toes in the sand Pulling in a big catch makes me feel like a man But the wife, she just don't understand I love walleye, perch, trout and bass And if you don't like fish, you can kiss my four-stroke right in the back Cause the fishes all tremble at the thought of me When I'm fishing for bun in country Today, we say congratulations and farewell. Henry Drews retiring as the Northwest Regional Fisheries Manager. This is his final week and his final interview on Fish and Paul Bunyan Country as the Northwest Regional Manager. We'll hear from Henry next. Welcome to Fish and Paul Bunyan Country. A little bittersweet day today because it's always fun to talk with Henry Drews, but uh, in his role as the Northwest Regional Fisheries Manager, this will be the last time retirement is looming. Henry, what are your thoughts off the top? Well, I guess my first thought is what the heck has happened in the last 35 years of my life? <laughs> I hear what you're saying. You know, I guess I guess uh, also it's, uh, it's bittersweet for me. I've loved my job working with the Department of Natural Resources for the past 35 years. I love all the people I've come to meet. I love all the sportsmen's groups that we've gotten to know and work with on on matters of interest to them on fisheries. And, uh, you know, I enjoy working with the media like you that do so much to help us get the word out. Well, it's always been a pleasure to talk with you, Henry, obviously. And, and uh, you've always – and one thing I, I really like about all the guys I ever talk with, with the DNR, um, they're pretty unvarnished. I mean, you'll tell the truth about what's going on, good, bad, or otherwise. Well, I think I think that sort of um, honesty, even if it's uh, something folks might not want to hear, is what people expect, you know, of public employees. And and I've taken pride working for the state of Minnesota, being a, a person that's paid for entirely by the the licenses that fishermen buy. You know, I take that seriously, and uh, so being honest is an important part of that. Well, we may have had this this conversation a long time ago, but uh, for those who who maybe didn't hear that because uh, it was probably a while ago. Tell us your journey. Where are you from? How did you find your way into the Northwest Regional Fisheries Office? Well, I, I grew up in the state of Virginia and did a lot of my fishing on the East Coast. And so mm. that's my background. I would, Some say I was born with a fishing rod in my hand. My mm. mom, who was from Tasmania, Australia, um, bestowed in me a love of fishing and a love of the outdoors. And from there, I went to Virginia Tech, got a bachelor's degree there, and then the next thing you need to do in our profession is get a master's degree. So I went to South Dakota State University, my first time across the Mississippi. <laughs> you know, so that was quite an interesting journey to the Midwest and fell in love with the Midwest and, and never wanted to leave. Did some part-time gigs by way of Oklahoma, Montana, Indiana. Uh, got a job in the Twin Cities with the Minnesota DNR in 1986. Um, started during a blizzard. <laughs> Had some second thoughts. And then just followed some opportunities um, in Minnesota, uh, eventually landing here in Bemidji as a regional manager, a uh, position I've had for the last 23 years, and uh, it's been absolutely fantastic. Now, if I recall, you were here for a while, and then you had another post before you came back to Bemidji. Correct. I was the assistant regional fisheries manager. I worked for Bob Strand, who was the regional manager, an icon in the Bemidji fishing community and the, the musky world in yeah. the Midwest. I worked for Bob for about five years, and then um, I took a a promotion to St. Paul and went down there and spent five years down there coordinating the statewide lake and stream survey program, coordinating fishing tournament permitting program, uh, special and experimental regulations, and a whole bunch of other things. And uh, that was a great move, but my wife Annette and I always had an eye on the potential of returning to Bemidji. That's where we wanted to raise a family. And Bob retired 23 years ago, competed for his job, and was fortunate to come out on top. And uh, the rest, of they, as they say, <laughs> is history. Indeed, raised a couple of daughters here, and uh, and now you're you got sons-in-laws and sons-in-laws to be. I mean, my life has changed, huh? It has, and and every step in the journey has been fun. You know, yeah. from from the chaos of being young parents and learning how to how to raise little children through the next chapter of chaos of junior high and high school sports then moving into how do you how do you pay for college and what are they going to do after that and and Annette's been tracking through different jobs along you know the same journey with me and and holy cow it it all seems so complicated at the time and then and then you're here you're 62 years old you're retiring and you got a you got a whole new frontier ahead of you (laughs) you do 
Well, Henry, it's 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 been a an eventful journey these last twenty three years. You've had some really big projects when it comes to fisheries here in the northwest part of the state. Yeah, it's been so exciting, and you know, none of these things that I'm going to mention did I do by myself. They're all team efforts within the DNR and with external partners like our tribes. But having to be involved with the restoration of the Red Lakes, and clearly a, a, a national icon for fish management has been a just a tremendous opportunity and a joy to have been there um, working hand in hand with Gary Barnard who retired a year ago I mean we we got to see a lot of stuff and then the relationships with the tribe working with the Red Lake Band and their commitment the state commitment to partner on that restoration there was a lot of naysayers mm -hmm. in 2002 to 2006 um, and then even after it opened there was folks that that didn't think we would be successful and look where we are 16 years later it's still a fabulous fishery and everybody's um, doing what they said they would do from the onset um, and then Lake Sturgeon restoration I feel really good about that again a team effort um, I remember the first uh, committees and work groups we put together up on International Falls and Baudette talking about a new way to manage this species and how to restore it and protect it harvest tags and and seasons and and protected slots and or harvest slots and then the stocking we did throughout the red river basin and, the, and then you add to that the dam removal and modification that helps those fish we put in the rivers get to where they need to spawn um, when i started here in 1988 there was eight dams on the main stem red river that were are basically tourniquets to fish migration there's one left and it's being scheduled to be removed the drayton dam so those fish will have 400 miles of open passage for sturgeon to move up and down that river and into the tributaries and who would have thought that in 1988 so that's that's some of the things the, the last thing i'll mention for you kevin is uh, the work that um the area supervisors in this region and myself did on experimental regulations special regulations uh, northern pike slot limits um, sunfish reduced bag limits all that work we did in the in the 2000s ultimately provided the the backdrop for the new zone regulations for northern pike and the expansion of quality bluegill regulations in the state so i feel really good about that um, our areas worked with their local groups and the lake associations to build support for these they didn't all work but a, enough of them worked that let us take that next step and, and expand that to a more broader application so so that's been fun, really fun. Good science. Yeah. Did you, I don't think you even mentioned Leech Lake. That was a biggie too. Oh yeah, that was a that was one. If I had to list uh, some of the the most difficult times in my career up here, I would I would certainly mention Leech Lake and the downturn of the walleye fishery, the explosion of the the cormorant population in the in the mid, early 2000s, 2003 to 2006. Those were some tough times. We were not very popular in the community. We had to really, really work to restore trust and confidence and implement some measures to try to build that fishery back. And uh, I think we've been largely successful. We used an input group down there, a citizen's input group, to help guide that process. So that would have been one of the tough ones. And the other one is some of the issues with muskie management in the region. You know, there's still, even though it's a very limited program, a very successful program, there are naysayers. And uh, muskie management has been had some very interesting political challenges over the years that isn't uh, that isn't uh, something that is just in this part of the state muskie management seems to be a controversial issue wherever it's brought up it's a lightning rod it's not at all um, that different than the wolf issue and how do you manage timber wolves there's yeah. people nobody's really in the middle on musky management you're either a staunch advocate or you think they're the devil reincarnate <laughs> um so so that that's been a challenge but um but our large lakes up here uh we we use these citizen input groups called fisheries input groups with local businesses resort owners um regional anglers other interested parties uh, about 12 to 15 persons on these groups we have those in place for lake of the woods Cass, um upper red and leach and it's a fairly innovative approach to getting real focused input into our management efforts on those lakes. These, these input groups help, help refine our management objectives and the actions to achieve those objectives. And it's really taking these 12 to 15 people, lifting the hood and letting them look at the engine 
and and when you get to spend that much time with people they start talking the same way as we do with different acronyms but they start understanding things like year classes and the relationship between predators and prey and impact of invasive species and it's really been fun it's been innovative um, it's really a model for lake management I think in the country one of the things I've always said to to you I think and, and others in your field and even in the wildlife field is that you have to be patient because if I've got a leaky window I replace the window and then it's fixed you know it might take me longer than it would take somebody else but it doesn't take that long when you're putting together a project to try to restore a fishery or do something I mean we're not going to see impacts for a number of years. Absolutely. Uh, one example of that is lake sturgeon restoration. The first lake sturgeon we moved from the Rainy River to the Red River Basin to restore lake sturgeon in their native range. That was in 1997. Mm-hmm. This year, we've seen the first documented natural reproduction in the Ottertail River, and that, that is a product of 20-plus years of management efforts so so some other things take that long even with I'll give you an example trying to improve a bluegill population to grow a nine inch bluegill on a lot of lakes around here takes eight to ten years people don't really understand that it's a sunfish for goodness sakes <laughs> it takes yeah. twice as long to grow a nine inch bluegill as it does a ten point buck wow so so you're absolutely right the fruits of our labors are not always manifest in, in short term, and, and people's interests are, are a little quicker than that. I mean, even sure. if you initiate a walleye stocking program with fry, it's going to be four years, if it's successful, till they show up on the angler's line. So um, patience is a virtue, I've always been told, and <laughs> sometimes elements of our constituency don't have that much patience. <laughs> you guys, though, it's beyond a virtue. It's a necessity <laughs> yeah, to yes. get through the day, right? It is, but you know, you know that when you get out of school and you take the job that you're working for the public. You're not working for yourself. You're not working for the DNR. You're really working for a, a, a constituent base, and that's our anglers. In the case of wildlife, that's the hunters. I hope this is not our final visit with Henry Drews, but it will be our final visit with Henry Drews as the Northwest Regional Fisheries Manager as he retires this week. We'll have more with Henry next on Fish and Paul Bunyan Country. Oh. Hi, this is Dick Beardsley with Dick Beardsley Fishing Guide Service. Are you looking to plan a fishing trip? Look no further as Bemidji, Minnesota is your year-round destination for walleyes, pike, muskie, bass, perch, crappie, panfish, and more. With over 400 fishing lakes within a 25-mile radius of Bemidji, come take a cast of becoming a fishing legend. While you're on your fishing adventure, come take a picture with the historic Paul Bunyan and Babe the Blue Ox. Discover the first city on the Mississippi... Bemidji, one step further. Today on Fish and Paul Bunyan Country, we're visiting with my friend Henry Drews, retiring this week as the Northwest Regional Fisheries Manager. Your mom says you were born with a fishing rod in your hand. That means you were on the ground, and I know you're still out there fishing and doing all that stuff all the time. Um, So you get into this business to be on the lakes, to be on the rivers, to do these things. And then when you get to your level, you're probably not seeing a whole lot of that action anymore. Well, in my job, I, I, I do fish a lot. I, I fish 75 to 90 times a year, I'd say. Now, that's not a lot compared to many of your guests, <laughs> but my wife says it's a lot, and my friends say it's a lot. But I, and my answer to them is not as often as I think about it. But, you know, I enjoy fishing now. The, the job doesn't dissuade me from going fishing. The, the time in my career, the, some of the funnest stuff I did was when I was a, a specialist, you know, an aquatic biologist, and I was out running nets, running gill nets, running trap nets. And I loved it. You're out in the boat every day. That was great. It's a fun part of my career I, I cherish um, and look back on with great memories. That said... After you're taking half rotten fish out of gill nets for five days a week, Saturday morning jumping in a boat and go out and catching a fish, you know, wasn't necessarily always a high priority. Yeah. So I've actually fished more after I moved into <laughs> supervision and administration than I did when I was a field field person. So we've had you on twice a year, every year, sometimes more than that, depending on what was going on, but always at the beginning of the year to talk about how things are looking at the end of the year, how the summer went. 
But what is it that the Northwest Regional Fisheries Supervisor does on a daily basis? What are the key things you are doing? Well, um, just yesterday, I was doing a second interview for a potential candidate to fill a vacant supervisor position. That involved a six hours in the car and a two-hour interview. Um, so th- that's kind of a day. But the, the, the typical day is, is um, it, it involves some administration. I'd say that's about 25% of my time, personnel stuff, hiring, um, performance reviews, all that sort of stuff. About half of the day is dealing with fisheries issues that involve uh, whether it's a tournament tournament permit application, a a permit application to stock fish by somebody in a private lake. Um, It could be a complaint about a regulation or how fishing's going. Um, Reviewing management plans and lake surveys. One of my uh, things I take a great deal of pride in is while I've been the regional manager and even back when I was assistant, I've read every lake survey and every management plan written in this entire region, seven field offices. So that equates to, on average, about 400 lake survey reports and about 150 management plans. Multiply that times 28 years. <laughs> yeah. But I take great joy and pride in reading those surveys and editing them if necessary, asking the, the, per, the field office that prepared them questions. And then that translates into the management plans and actions for those lakes. So then the management plans, I review all those and approve those. All the stocking uh, proposals are reviewed and approved in my office, uh, Ted and myself. So, so that's the big block. That's the fun part. That's the wheelhouse. And as, you, as you've talked to guests and that over the years, the lake finder information that people can go to, where you get your lake of the week stuff, um, that all comes from our lake surveys. So every one of those reports, I've had the pleasure over the last 25-plus years of reading those and the management plans that guide the actions. I'll really miss that because that, that is really the centerpiece of fish management is that information. So that's about half the job, and the other half is, you know, whatever the phone or the email brings. <laughs> you know, yeah. a quarter, the other quarter of the job, so... Yeah. Some days you go in and you have a uh, have a game plan uh, to to do these, to review these thirty management plans, and you never get to it because you get derailed by a legislature calling about the four walleye bag limit, or or or, or a tribal issue emerges where you've got to help help you know people get through something. Um, you just never know always. Mm. Wow. Um. From you on down, people who get a job in this type of field, it's not like, well, I'm looking for a job. This would be a good one. You have to do the training you go through and the education you need to be able to get a job. This this is a passion for pretty much everybody who's in that office. We, The average fisheries person or the average wildlife person, for that matter, the average forester, you live it, you breathe it, you walk it. You know, you, you you usually got into this uh, as a youngster by a passion for fishing. And then that you go to college and you take heavy in biology and science classes. And then you find out, well, there's actually careers in fisheries and wildlife. And you get your bachelor's degree. And then I'd say 75% of our professional staff have, have a master's degree. And um, and then that gives you that that background. And the master's degrees are always pretty focused on field work and and how to how to answer problems, and then you get employed as a professional, and you're answering problems all the time. <laughs> so, yeah, we walk it, live it, breathe it. It's it's uh, in the blood for most of our employees. Okay. Well, as you look at um, the panorama of the last many years, um, we talked about some of the things you're most proud of. But overall, what are your thoughts about where we're at? in fisheries management in the state of Minnesota? Uh, I think we're in really good place, to be honest with you. That's the big picture from 10,000 feet. Um, we have just remarkable fishing opportunities in the state, you know, from walleye to to muskie, to panfish, to, to bass, smallmouth, largemouth bass, channel catfish, flathead catfish, lake sturgeon, and then all the, the, the smaller known, lesser known fisheries um, like trout. You know, the southeast has some of the best brown trout fishing in the United States. Lake Superior, during my career, I've watched my colleagues bring that fisheries back to a self-sustaining native lake trout population. Remarkable, remarkable success story. 
the Boundary Waters experiences. So overall, I think it's, it's things are really in really a good place. Now, what are the challenges? I think the challenges are, and we're still learning, is what is the combined impact going to be to our lakes and the fisheries from invasive species like zebra mussels plus a warming lake environment? It's a fact our lakes are getting warmer. It's a fact panfish and bass populations are expanding and it's becoming more difficult to manage for walleye in some waters. Those are, those are facts. Um, why are these shifts taking place? Largely because of warming water temperatures in the lake favoring bass and panfish over some of the other species. We are seeing declining populations of our, some of our cold water fish like whitefish and tulabies and, and perhaps you can add eel powder, burbot to that list. So as the lakes get warmer and those habitats become less favorable for cold water species, we're going to see them retreat northward. So why, why would we care so much about whitefish and tulabi? Well, they're, they're what grow our trophy walleyes and our trophy pike and trophy muskie. They're an important forage species and, to some, an important angling species. So, so these shifts are real. They're happening. Um, with invasive species like zebra mussels in particular, we're starting to see on some lakes, not all lakes, but some lakes as that water gets clear, we get increased plant growth and couple that with warming temperatures, uh, we're seeing the lake ecology change and we're seeing some lakes have less ability to maintain high walleye abundance despite stocking. Yeah. Switching back to, to, to the good news is I think in the last five years we've, we've implemented some real innovative approaches to managing northern pike and to managing uh, bluegill populations. And I think, um, I think we're going to see improved pike populations and improved bluegill quality. And, and that's something to look forward to for anglers. Yeah. You know, obviously the, the good news also is we've seen a big uptick in angling uh, licenses and angling hours uh, in the last two years. But, of course, then the concern would be, uh, if we're having these changes, that that could have some impacts down the road too. But but you don't want to say no to getting people on the water. No, you know we have had two good years of uh, participation in license sales and and lots of kids out there with their families. I see that in particular in the winter in the wheelhouses with the families out on the lakes, and that's really good. And you know I I think that's great news for us as fish managers. Not not oh we're going to have problems managing this. Mm -hmm. It's good news. Minnesota nationally has bucked the trend in declining license sales for, for fishing licenses. Most states, particularly as you go east, are seeing a precipitous decline in angling participation and especially hunting participation. Minnesota bucks that trend. We are, we are basically, if you look at a we're flat line on license sales over the last 25 years, if you run a line through the annual data, which is good. Now, it's, we're going down as a percent of the population as the population grows, but holding our own on license sales and participation, seeing what's happened nationally is good news. It's because of the wonderful resources that we have here in Minnesota. Um, so I, I, I don't think it's heavy participation is bad news. We want those new people in. And if it makes our job harder, that's okay. You know, that's what, that's what anglers want us to do is be able to adapt and manage, you know, in changing conditions. You know, what we did one day that used to work may not work now. So we have to adapt. We have to change our approaches. Henry Drews, his final interview as the Northwest Regional Fisheries Manager on Fish and Paul Bunyan Country. What are your key concerns as you uh, step away uh, and look to the future? Well, you know, we talked, we talked a little bit about them. You know, it's the, it's the combined effect of invasive species in a warming, warming lake environment, warming climate. We don't know what that's going to look like. There's all sorts of models that project what's going to look like for landscape with trees and perhaps with wildlife, and the fish is kind of we're learning as we go. If our climate ends up looking more like northern Kansas, you know, we're going to have less cold water fishing opportunities. We're going to have more bass and panfish. It's going to be harder to manage for walleye in some waters. Not universal, but some waters. So, mm -hmm. um, so the invasive species, as that march continues, is, is something to see what happens. Um, on previous shows, we've talked about muskies. Um, we're, we're not looking to expand our program for muskies into a lot of new lakes. You know, we'd like to add a few new lakes strategically. But what we're seeing in, in, in those lakes that we're in, where we 
started stacking back in the late 80s and early 90s, we're seeing them reach a point of maturation where despite continuous and, and standard uh, stocking programs, we're not seeing more. The abundance has gone down. The size has gone up. So basic, basically where we're at on muskies now is we have old growth forests. Mm. We have fewer numbers of muskies but large muskies in a lot of lakes. And, and anglers like that high catch rate, that high contact muskie fishery that those lakes had when they were only 12 to 15 years into their management program. So we're, we're trying some different things there. So, so how do we satisfy the demand for muskie angling? It's going to be a challenge going forward because that's a, lar- a large growing segment of our, of our angling population. Still the best muskie fishing in the whole Midwest. Mm-hmm. Probably rivals better than Canada, some many have told me. But, but there are certain lakes that aren't as good as they used to be, and so we need to figure out what we can do differently. So I, I'd say those. You know, the other thing is gear. There's a lot of talk about the about the gear that people are using now that it's an unfair advantage for fish. The uh, things like pan optics, live scope, side scan sonar, and all that. And it is going to make very good fishermen even better. Uh, an average fisherman like me, um, I'll turn that equipment on and get frustrated with it and turn it off and just start start fishing like I used to. So <laughs> it's not going to take everybody and elevate them to some elite status, but but it will make some anglers a lot more effective. Um, and so there's a lot of buzz. What are you going to do about it? What can we do about it? And, and I'm not so sure that we really need to do anything about it. It's 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 going to have to get back to the individual and ethics and, and limits and things like that. When I think about how equipment's changed, just to be a little nostalgic here, um, while these things seem like they're game changers right now, I look at the size of boats compared to when I started in Minnesota in 1986 and everybody had a 16-foot LUN. And I remember when the Pro-V came out or the LUN tie and it was like, ooh, ah, ooh, he's got a 90-horse motor. You look at the boats launching on these lakes today, <laughs> and and they're they're huge. They're they're 200 horse, 300 horse, up to 400 horsepower outboards. The equipment is incredible, and they're all being pulled by four wheel drive trucks, quad cabs, and that. And in the winter, they got a fish house that matches the boat that they have for the summer. When I was up here, and I moved up here in 1988, and I remember going to Red Lake. It was everybody had portables made with blue tarps and plywood. Yeah, you know. And and no one had a pickup truck with four wheel drive. I mean, if you had a four wheel drive pickup truck in 1988, everybody wanted to go winter ice fishing with you. <laughs> now I can't. I don't know anybody who doesn't have a four wheel drive truck. Um, Most people have four wheel drive SUVs and cars now. Yeah, I was. I remember being on Red Lake one day last year in the winter. It was a beautiful day. It was very busy. It was a Saturday, and and I was in my little red hub house. You know, you pop it up, you sit there, put the sunflower heater in there, or the big buddy heater. You know, and, and it's insulated, and it's just comfortable. And I went outside to, to grab something, I looked around, and there's hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of wheelhouses all around me, everywhere, as far as the eye could see. And I thought, I'll be damned. I'm the only person on this lake in a tent. <laughs> I'm the only person out here in a, in a $200 fish house. Everybody else is in single-axle, double-axle, triple-axle wheelhouses, so... So the equipment changes, not just the electronics, but the trucks and the boats and the fish houses. To me, that's the most remarkable change I've seen in 35 years. Wow. Yeah, that is, that is a big change. And it's really actually, within the last decade, exploded. Yes. Yes, yeah. in particular, the wheelhouses. But but just, heck, every 16-year-old kid in Bemidji has a four-wheel <laughs> drive truck. <laughs> Yeah, yeah. <laughs> it's just it's just crazy. So the equipment thing is more than just the uh, two thousand dollar, three thousand dollar, nine twelve inch screen that people are looking at with their side imaging. It's it's the whole package. Your your final thoughts to um, the North Country. Well, I just uh, being on the air. I just want to uh, you know thank everybody for if I've met you. Thank everybody for the, your participation on sportsmen's clubs, groups, lake associations, you know, offering your ideas, your support for our programs, and uh, the relationships we have throughout Paul Bunyan country from our field offices and the staffs there with your listeners um, has been fantastic. I look at look forward to that continuing, but thank you for, uh, 
for all your efforts towards conservation of our, our fishing resources and getting those young people out on the water. You put your blood, sweat, and tears into this job for a long time. So what is your hope uh, for uh, the Northwest region going forward? Well, I think we've got great staff. I mean, I, I've hired everybody in this region. You know, I've been here long enough, and, and they're great people. I mean, just listeners visit one of our field offices and get to know those folks. Um, you know, looking forward, I, I just hope we have um, the constituent base that supports us, and then we'll deliver programs that support them. And uh, and the key to all of that is communication and, um, and getting out there and working together. And I, I think... I think we have a foundation here that, that that I inherited. Hopefully I've built on some, and hopefully the, the person that comes behind me can carry on. I think it's solid. For a little while longer, he is the Northwest Regional Fisheries Manager uh, out of the office here in Bemidji, Henry Drews. When, when is your actual retirement date? Um, August 2nd is my last day, okay. and then I'll be in Alaska on August 5th. Okay. Well, Henry, i got to tell you, um, it's been great talking with you over the years. Uh, I really appreciate your openness, your kindness, and your passion for the industry. I hope you have a tremendous retirement, and I hope you get all kinds of cards and well wishes. You deserve every bit of it. Thanks a lot, Kevin, and, and um, good luck to you and Fishing Paul Bunyan Country. I think I've been with you since its inception, Yeah, and it's been a fun ride. And now I will go out and join that legion of informed anglers that if you need a fishing report from, you can call me, and I'll have a different hat on then. <laughs> okay. I, I will do that. Trust me, I will. Henry, congratulations, and thank you. Thank you, Kevin. Before we wrap it up, once again, hats off to Henry Drews, a very dedicated public servant, passionate about fishing and hunting, for that matter, but in his role as supervisor, fishing, worked very hard for the Northwest region, and you look around at the fishing we have available, you have to say, well done, Henry Drews. An absolute class act and a really good guy, and I hope he has a very long and very enjoyable retirement. Thank you, Henry. Take care. Fishing, Paul Bunyan Country.